YouTube, and MCAT is actually going to go ahead and um, show them and post them. So they're still working with us, even though. Oh, good. Well, I'll give, them a give them credit. I'll give them a shout out tonight then too. I, I've been skipping them lately because I didn't realize that. Yeah, no, this is a fairly new development, but yeah, they they asked if we wanted to do that. And I was like, it would be great to have it as an entire connection uh, collection. So yes. Great. And um, the, the other thing is to announce about next week's lecture. Don't let, let us not forget to do that at the end, okay? Oh yeah, I better make sure. Thank you for the reminder. I will make sure that I have uh, that open. Oh, hi, Annie. Hello. Hi, Annie. Hi, Peter. How are you? Good. It's good to see you. Same. I love your bio. I just uh, reread it a few minutes ago. It's uh, it's so amazing and so inspirational what you oh, what you've done. Thank you. That's very nice. I'm. Yeah, I'm really glad that this worked out for tonight. I mean, I'm sorry for the circumstances under which it worked out, but <laughs> yeah. I'm, glad, I'm glad to be able to be a part of this. No, that's one of the blessings that we can count from uh, amidst all of the other disappointments that we've had lately. Yeah. How are things seeming in Missoula? It's warm here today. I usually start pretty close to on time, so we'll see. And uh, the other thing is we do need to finish um, no later than 7.45 tonight because of the uh, yeah, meeting, I, meeting coming up. I will definitely, I don't think there's any risk I'll go over. I might be even be, able, I was thinking about that with the meeting that I might even try to make it a little bit shorter. Yeah, no, I don't want you to cut anything short. I just, the, it may be the question and answer period that okay. gets a little truncated, though. Um, and either Peter or Annie, um, be sure when question time comes to let people know that they can use the chat. Um, and I will monitor that, Annie, and if you don't see it, I will let you know if there's questions there. Great. Thanks, Kelly. Okay, I think we're ready to start. Thank you, everyone, for coming this evening. Uh, we really are very fortunate to have Annie Lynn uh, talking to us about malaria in Senegal, and she is the technical advisor for malaria on the President's Malaria Initiative for USAID. Uh, Annie has a really incredible background. She uh, grew up in Belgrade, Montana, uh, and then was, while she was an undergraduate student at Pacific Lutheran University, uh, she discovered her passion for global health while she was studying foreign languages. Uh, she decided to pursue further experience and she went into the Peace Corps Masters International Program at Tulane University, uh, where she received her Masters of Public Health in International Health and Development. So after that, Annie came back uh, with her husband while she was waiting for her Peace Corps placement. She came back to Montana, and that's where I first met her when she was working as a program coordinator 
from the Western Montana Area Health Education Center. And Annie was very helpful when we set up the minor in global public health while she worked in that position. Um, so then she went to, into the Peace Corps uh, to Senegal. She spent two years there working on a pilot project for a proactive model of community case model, a community case management of malaria, also establishing cervical cancer screening services and a harm reduction product, project that uh, focused on mercury exposure in gold mining. After that, she went to work at Rutgers University and establishing a global health program there after the experience she had at the University of Montana, which probably helped a lot. Uh, she did that within the School of Nursing and then to Johns Hopkins, where she worked for the Demographic and Health Surveys Program, a global survey project that monitors, monitors the health situation of countries around the world. In her current role as a contractor for USAID in the President's Malaria Initiative, she works on community health worker programs and provides technical guidance on monitoring and evaluation of US funded malaria programs. Uh, uh, Annie adds that she misses Montana dearly. And uh, I add that we are very pleased to have her on the external advisory committee of the University of Montana's global public health program. So with that uh, introduction, I'll turn it over to Annie for her talk on proactive community case management. Great, thank you, Peter. Um, I think I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, um, and can you confirm, Peter, that you see just, just a slide? We, Kelly and I were playing with this and make, making sure that it worked. Well, I can, I can see it. Okay, great. Um, so hi, everyone. Thank you so much um, for having me this evening. Um, I, like Peter said, I'm originally from Belgrade, but I'm calling from Greenbelt, Maryland, a suburb of DC tonight. Um, I'm a malaria technical advisor for the President's Malaria Initiative. Um, and uh, as Peter said, I got originally involved with U of M's global public health program when it was being formulated as a minor and I was uh, working at, at the U of M um, in, in the Western Montana Area Health Education Center. Um, and then I left Missoula to be a Peace Corps volunteer. And then I think that the story is worth telling that I got involved again because I literally ran into Peter on the sidewalk um, when I was on a run in DC. Um, and I, I was jogging down the street and, I, and he was, and I saw him, I thought that looks exactly like Peter Kern and he was in town visiting his sons, and so I, I stopped and um, struck up a conversation, and um, and we reconnected, and it's been great to, to be involved with the Global Public Health Program. Um, so currently, as Peter said, I am a malaria technical advisor for the President's Malaria Initiative, and I, I have to say that for my lecture tonight, um, it is not on behalf of the U.S. government. I'm speaking as a private individual and a member of the External Advisory Committee. Obligatory disclaimer is over, um, but at, at President's Solar Initiative, or PMI, I, I work on surveillance, monitoring, and evaluation, and I'm the focal point for community health workers and community case management of malaria. And this role of working on community health workers is really near and dear to my heart, because what my passion within global health is, is putting structures in place that empower community health workers to maximize their potential to serve their communities and, and save lives. And the source of this passion is the experience that I had as a Peace Corps volunteer in Senegal. So I'm actually going to be talking tonight about my work there, which was also the, um, the subject of my master's research. Um, and I'm really fortunate to still be able to be involved with this work as it's ongoing um, and touches my current role. So let's back up a little bit and just talk about um, malaria and where we are um, with malaria in the world today. Um, obviously, malaria continues to be a major public health issue, and particularly for children under five and pregnant women. And after failed eradication attempts in the 1950s, it took the world and the global community a really long time to have the, the will to touch this issue again. They, it really wasn't any, anything the, the, the international community wanted to touch until around the early 2000s with the launch of the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, and the U.S. President's Malaria Initiative, where I work. 
Um, and with these um, big investments, uh, we were able to scale up these um, programs on malaria prevention and control that led to huge reductions in malaria burden. Um, so what you see here are, um, is from the, this last year's World, World Malaria Report. Um, but if you, and this starts in 2010, you can see the decreases. Um, but if you were to back that up to 2000, this, the curve would be even steeper. Um, between 2000 and 2013 alone, when they were starting to look at where our uh, progress were, was towards the Millennium Development Goals, um, malaria deaths decreased by 54% um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, so huge decreases. Um, so in 2018, we had 228 million cases and 405,000 deaths, which are still huge numbers and are still unacceptable. Um, but compared to where we were 20 years ago, um, it's, we've made really tremendous progress. Um, so, and 90% of these deaths are in Sub-Saharan Africa and 54% of malaria cases are in just two countries, in Nigeria and DRC. So um, this burden is really concentrated in a few, in, on the continent of Africa and in, this, in, in, in the countries really where the population is highest and that and are located um, in, sorry, my mouse is getting away from me. Okay. Um, so, but I think I have to, you know, so we're really proud of the progress that we've made, but I can't show this data without um, acknowledging several things. And the first is that there's a lot of worry that this curve here um, has kind of leveled off since 2016, um, where there had been just really um, incredible gains that were made up until that point, there was, has been stagnation in the last few years. And, the, you know, some of that could be due to, you know, population growth, um, which is really uh, significant on, on the continent of Africa. Also, we're, um, data reporting systems have improved drastically, so we're, we're getting more data um, about the cases and deaths, um, but it's still, it's still quite concerning. And the international community has been scrambling to figure out how we can um, you know, maximize the interventions that we have available, look at what's coming down the pike in terms of research and development to continue to drive down the burden of malaria. Because when in 2013, when we were seeing these massive decreases, some really aggressive targets were set for 2030. And on the basis of the progress we've made since then, we're not there. And that used to be our biggest worry, um, but now we have COVID-19. And in this environment, there are really enormous worries about the kinds of second order health impacts that we're going to see on things like malaria. So in places with fragile health systems where the pandemic is really, like in Africa, where the pandemic is really just starting to arrive, um, it'll probably peak in three to six months, we're really worried about being able to maintain essential health services for things like malaria. This is going to impact, and already is impacting the supply chain and care seeking and the ability to deliver care and the ability to deliver interventions like bed net campaigns or spraying um, or giving preventive treatments to children and pregnant women. And there was some modeling that was recently released from WHO Global Malaria Program where they said in a worst case scenario where if, if all bed net campaigns were suspended, and access to anti-malarials was cut by 75%, that 769,000 people would die in this year alone, just in the Africa region. And so that sets us back 20 years. So things are really worrisome right now. I spend most of my day talking about COVID-19 and not malaria these days, but that is not the focus of tonight's talk. So we're just, but I felt like I needed to say that if I'm talking about um, global malaria numbers and where we've come and where we may or hopefully not be going. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the President's Malaria Initiative so that people can know where your um, tax dollars are going. Um, so the uh, PMI was started in 2005. Um, it was started in just three countries and it's led by USAID, the Agency for International Development, but in, in coordination with CDC. Um, and you can see here over this timeline how we started in three countries and, have, and because of the good work that has been happening, Congress has continued to allocate more and more money to the fight against malaria. And for fiscal year 2019, we're up to 27 countries and a budget of $729 million. Um, and it's been, it's considered just a gem of the, of the global health world and really um, has been um, very, very successful at, um, at, at driving the and contributing to the changes that I showed earlier. 
Um, so 24 of the countries that we've operated on are in Sub-Saharan Africa and about 85% of the global malaria burden is in those countries. And then there's three countries in Asia and the greater Mekong subregion. And the reason that we're in those countries is, is because um, anti-malarial resistance has always started there. And so really we're trying to eliminate malaria in those countries. So if you look at what PMI does, um, I think often when malaria is in the news, what you hear about are these flashy things like vaccine or genetically modified mosquitoes or um, you know, dogs that can smell malaria. And those are all very exciting things and not to, to um, say anything against that, but what PMI is funded by Congress to do um, is to scale up proven interventions. Um, and, and so that is what we do. We do the bread and butter stuff. So the vaccine that's coming out in order to be effective, that vaccine has to be um, given, has, there's four doses, it has to be given exactly, you know, a month apart, there's, there's lots of, and it's, an, it's only 40% effective. So what has to happen in the background to make sure that, you know, we're not just concentrating on this vaccine? Um, so PMI concentrates on three main areas. And so the first uh, two columns are talking about vector control. So we procure and work with partners to distribute mosquito nets, um, and to conduct indoor residual spraying of, of houses. Um, so within the, the vector control mosquito area, that's those are our main interventions. And then we have um, preventive drug-based prevention. And so um, this focuses on children under five and pregnant women. So IPTP is intermittent preventive treatment in pregnancy, um, during which a woman um, in her antenatal care visits will receive um, every time she goes in, in in the second and third trimesters, preventive doses of, of drugs um, that um, every month that she, she goes in at least three doses during the course of the pregnancy. Also in the Sahel in West Africa, um, the newest intervention that we have is called seasonal malarial chemo, chemo prevention. And during in, this is in highly seasonal areas of malaria transmission where kids under five or under 10 in some countries uh, receive a preventive dose of malaria drugs um, once a month during the rainy season. Uh, and then we have appropriate case management, um, which is rapid diagnostic tests um, and malaria medications that we um, procure and, and distribute. And also train health workers on, on administering the tests and, and uh, prescribing the, tr the treatment. Um, so you can see here the numbers that were um, distributed in, in fiscal year 2019 and then the people that they protected and as well as the training numbers that happened. Um, so, so what I want to talk about a bit more um, for tonight is the, the idea of appropriate case management. So the tests and the treatment. Um, when we talk about appropriate case management, um, the global technical strategy um, that WHO put out for malaria um, has a goal of ensuring universal access to appropriate case management. So what that means is that all cases are parasitologically confirmed. So until about the mid aughts, most cases of malaria were, were treated presumptively. Um, fever, you know, depending on where you were during the rainy season, fever was just considered malaria. And this is problematic for several reasons. Um, first of all, if it's not malaria, then whatever is actually causing that fever is gonna go untreated. But also then if you're giving out antimalarials to people that don't have malaria, you're just increasing the pressure on those drugs. Um, and antimalarial resistance is an issue, which um, just a side note, um, when we talk about malaria medicines here, we're not talking about the drug chloroquine that has been in the news um, of late. Um, because in the late 90s, there was widespread resistance to chloroquine in most, in most of most of Africa and actually you see like graphs of, of childhood mortality at that time and really there was there was big spikes um, when chloroquine resistance happened. So now what we have um, are drugs that are, that we call them ACTs and it's artemisinin based combination therapies. Um, so when we talk about appropriate case management, it's these tests and these drugs, but also there's a component of when that case management happens. And ideally you want it to be within 24 hours of the onset of fever. But as we're gonna talk about, that doesn't always happen um, because of maybe access to care. Um, but the, the, the most obvious reason is that's you know, availability of care. So whether if there's a health facility, 
in your village or, or town, um, then you may, you may be able to access care easier. Um, so what one strategy that the global community has really emphasized is community case management where community health workers who are among these health workers that have been trained with PMI funds, a lot of them are community health workers, um, which um, and the community health workers vary across countries uh, in terms of how they're compensated. A lot of them are volunteers, um, some are salary. There's a movement to really institutionalize them more and, and um, pay them salaries, but um, you know, the literacy level really varies. Um, but it's been found that community health workers can um, really have, the, when they're well trained, have the capacity to um, safely use rapid di diagnostic tests and adhere to their res the results. And they can properly prescribe ACTs um, for uncomplicated cases of malaria and then refer anything that's severe. Um, so, so community case management has been a really successful strategy at um, increasing access to care. Um, some studies have shown that um, it, it, that community case management has you know, has, has the potential to decrease under five mortality by forty percent, um, and then if you look at just malaria specific under five mortality by up to sixty percent, um, and even you know taking a step back from mortality and just looking at severe malaria cases, um, reducing that by fifty three percent. And as I mentioned, community health workers um, when they're well trained can can do these tasks. Um, we also talk a lot about integrated community case management. And so um, the three major childhood killers, um, kids under five in Africa are malaria, but also pneumonia and diarrhea. So in the integrated community case management platform, community health workers are trained not only on uh, the care uh, testing and treatment for malaria, but also for, for pneumonia and diarrhea. Um, and so when they can address these three issues, um, the use of services and, and the general quality of care has been shown to increase. And so that is really the widespread strategy that is used. So my first experience with community case management and in fact with PMI was as a Peace Corps volunteer in rural Senegal from 2012 to 2014. And PMI actually funded my master's thesis project where I worked with the community health workers in this picture. Um, but I want to zoom out for a minute and just give uh, some background on Senegal to give it a little bit of context. Um, Senegal is, is where you see this, uh, the red pin. It's a West African nation that has really been a beacon of peace and democracy in, in the region that, um, that all the rest of the countries haven't necessarily experienced that. Um, it gained independence from France in 1961 and then actually welcomed its first Peace Corps volunteers in 1963. Uh, and it's a really diverse country um, with lots of ethnic groups and local languages and Peace Corps actually teaches seven local languages. 95% um, of the country is Muslim, um, but really Senegal is a model for the world on, on interfaith harmony. Um, geographically, the northern part of the country is, is more desert. Is, the whole country is considered part of the Sahel belt below the Sahara. Um, and then the south um, is considered tropical savanna. So when you look at malaria in Senegal, it, the, the logical patterns of the geography follow. So um, the blue is the desert and there's not as much malaria there. Actually, Senegal is really in the stages of pre-elimination right now, it's really exciting. Um, this map is from 2013, which is when I was there. Um, so you see the burden of malaria getting greater and greater as you get further and further south. And um, this little spot right here is the, the town of Saria, and that's where I did my Peace Corps service. Um, and so at the time, um, throughout the year, 25% um, of outpatient visits were due to malaria um, and 85% of hospitalizations and then 67% of deaths in a health, health facility. So clearly it was a high burden. Um, and that's just in a place where the, the pre prevalence of, the, of malaria is about 14%. So we measure that by looking at doing a cross-sectional survey and um, taking blood samples from all the sampled kids um, under, under five and seeing who has malaria uh, parasite in their blood, whether they're symptomatic or not. And so they had about, so at that time it was 14%. A lot of the countries, um, that we that PMI works in, you know, you can you can have up to sixty percent prevalence um, 
during the rainy season. So really, Senegal, the burden is not that high comparatively, um, but you still see what a burden it is on the health health system. And this is over the course of the year. So during the rainy season from June to November, this 25% of outpatient visits is actually about 40%. Um, so Kedigu is also the poorest region of Senegal and the most rural. Um, and the other th thing of note is that at the time and now still today, there was a gold rush that was happening. And so um, that really drove every every element of life, um, including malaria prevention. Um, so the two villages down from where we lived that w ended up being the, the biggest gold mining site. Uh, people were coming from all over West Africa. It was very wild west. Um, but trying to, so when we, when we first got there, there was about 250 people in that, in that village. And by the time I left, they estimated it was between 20 and 30,000. And people just had, you know, the, it had become just this shanty town. So how do you do a bed net distribution when you have to, you know, the part of a bed net distribution is you do a census of all the people that are living there and you know, try to measure out the sleeping spaces, but it was just really chaotic and changing so much. And so, you know, the efforts to try to do a bed net distribution um, in that area were, um, were, it was really challenging. So that's, that's the context for um, my, my Peace Corps service and, and as well as the, the project that I'm going to describe. Um, so in 2008, um, Senegal introduced the PECADOME program, which um, is the French acronym, I mean, Prise en Charge à Domicile, so it's the French acronym for community case management. Um, and Senegal had had community health workers since about the 50s. They were really an early adopter of the, of the model. Um, but Pecadome really expanded it to any, any village who did not have a health, uh, health facility within five kilometers. And so it really got to the smallest villages. Um, and these were low level community health workers and all they were trained to do, they didn't do anything like vaccinations or anything. They, all they had was a backpack full of rapid diagnostic tests and ACTs. Um, and these community health workers are called DESDOMES or Dispensatiales Soins à Domicile. Um, and they saw great results compared to a re the, in the first region that they rolled this program out in, they saw a 43% decrease in hospitalization and a 63% decrease in deaths. But then when you look at the programmatic numbers, you were still seeing that the community health workers weren't actually testing and treating that many people, which made you think that there's, even though there's somebody that can test and treat in your village, that there are still barriers to access. So what are the barriers to access? What are the barriers to prompt treatment seeking? This treatment seeking within 24 hours of fever onset. Um, you have geographic, which they tried to address with um, the Pecanone program, but also financial, um, you know, the cost of treatment, um, educational, um, you know, and what we found was a lot of it came down to perception. Um, for example, the perception of cost. So as I mentioned before, and I showed the infographic, um, PMI and the Global Fund procure um, so all, all of the malaria meds almost that are that are used um, in, in the countries where we work. So malaria and people are not allowed to charge for medicine that they get for free. So malaria medication doesn't it does not cost anything. However, there there could be a perception that it does, and this is what I saw in, in my own anecdotal experience was was the biggest issue and 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 the lack of prompt treatment seeking was my biggest frustration as a volunteer because I would I was with my host family and in the rainy season I, you see a kid get sick and it's obviously malaria but they'll wait and they'll wait and they'll wait and they'll wait and um they kept saying well it's expensive and I would say no malaria meds are free but then when I would go in with one of the kids the nurse at the health center is so excited to have the opportunity to see a kid to give them deworming medication and vitamin c and they, the nurse speaks a different language than the, the caregiver. And so they are um, not able to take the time to explain like this laundry list of, of prescriptions that I'm giving you, all that really matters is this one here that you don't have to pay for. So then people might attach a value to the most expensive medicine is the most important one. Um, and so the, the perception that um, the malaria drugs are free is, is really a more tricky one than I had originally thought when, when going there. There's also the perception that like, well, it's just malaria, like it's usually fine, um, it's, you know, low risk or like, you know, adults have developed some immunity that, um, so, you know, they're not as vulnerable anymore. 
um, you know, if you have a community health worker that's someone that's from your village, there might be a perception that this person is not competent enough. They're not a doctor. They don't know how to um, give out give out ACTs. Or there might be a perception that might be based in reality that there's medication stockouts and wh whether, you know, doubts about whether um, these medications actually work. Um, and a 2008 study in Senegal found that 90% of malaria cases are first treated at home and often inappropriately. So as, as I mentioned, I, I arrived in Senegal in 2012 and became good friends with another volunteer in the same area who was had been there a year before me. And he had the really unfortunate and sad experience of um, a, a girl in his host family um, who died from malaria, even though the community health worker for the village lived in the same family compound. And it just really demonstrated that people were not seeking care. Um, even when it's just right there, even when it's a trusted person, um, that they just the inertia of not seeking care was was just a widespread thing. And so he and the community health worker, who was his community counterpart, a really good friend, um, spent a lot of time talking about what can we do. You know, we've been talking people's ears off, trying to get them to understand the importance um, you know, of, of changing their behavior, of seeking care, um, but they're not. And what was born was this um, model called Pecadome Plus. Um, so the original community case management um, where the caregiver had to seek care at the community health worker was Pecadome. So this was Pecadome Plus or Pecadome Case in, in French. So um, proactive community case management. And the idea was this, that instead of just being in their hut with their supplies, the community health worker would have just once a week go door to door to all of the, the compounds in the village and actively seek out cases of fever or other malaria symptoms. Um, they would train women to, to identify um, the signs and symptoms of malaria to be the first line screener. So they would, you know, you arrive at a house and they would ask uh, the woman who had been trained, like, who's, who's ill? Who, um, and... And then anyone who had a fever or was showing any other symptoms um, would be tested with an, a rapid diagnostic test and then treated on the spot if it was positive or referred um, if it was a severe case. And the idea was this was twofold because if you treat cases early, they're not going to, to progress to become severe malaria or deaths. Um, but also a mosquito needs to bite an infected host in order to transmit the parasite. So if you can treat people early, there is much less time when they're gonna be able to um, be infective to, or as effective to mosquitoes who can then pass it on to other people. So in 2012, the initial pilot of Pecanon Peace was implemented. Um, and they were, it was done in five villages. Um, there was a health post, um, a health facility that covered all five of these villages. Um, and so um, um, there's uh, Ian and Chick, the two guys that, that came up with this model. They're training the women um, from the compounds in one of the villages. Um, and then the community health workers there on the bottom. And then on the first day of these sweeps, so a sweep they go, is where they go to every single house. Um, they, they conducted in these five villages, 148 rapid diagnostic tests and 88, 88 of them were positive and they were treated on the spot. And then they compared that to the health facility data. So the same five villages, the exact same catchment area that this health post covers in the entire month, only 54 cases of malaria were treated versus the single day that were found um, in those villages um, through the sweeps. And so it really, um, just highlighted the amount of malaria that was going untreated and um, where, where um, treatment seeking just was not happening for whatever reason. Um, and then being that development, sometimes you can't do what you want to do. Um, there were, in 2012, there were massive stockouts of ACTs and RDTs. And so um, the health district said like, sorry, we can't, um, because you're going to be testing and treating more people, we just don't have the tests for it. We have to have them at the health facility. And so we, can you just do this in one village? So they cho chose just one village. And then what ended up happening was because the baseline had been established um, in all five villages, they were able to compare um, the village where the sweeps went forward. Um, because if you, if you go to every single house in the village, if you test every single person who is showing symptoms, you can get an estimate of the prevalence of symptomatic malaria on, on, on that day and then week by week. So what they found was, um, so Sekoto is the village in the blue here where um, the 
cases continued over the five months of the rainy season. Um, and so the beginning, the, the positive RDTs out of the entire population um, was actually higher than in the, in the other villages. Um, but then by the end of the rainy season, so during this time in the middle, um, were five months of weekly sweeps in Tecoto. And prevalence in Tecoto on the last day was um, eight and a half times lower what they saw in the other villages. And everything, the villages are very similar, everything else is the same. But this is a very small sample, so we weren't sure what was going on, but it seems like it was definitely something worth exploring more. So I was in the, um, was based in, in Saria, which was the, where the health district, the health center that covered um, this entire area. And so um, they were excited enough about this that they wanted to do a, um, a pilot of, um, of this with a, with a larger sample size and some like more rigorous methods to see what's actually happening. And so, and I needed a master's project, so it was a perfect fit. Um, and had, having been involved the first year, it could, really saw the potential and was really excited to continue working on this. So um, we decided to do a pilot study um, in 15 villages um, and the goal being to decrease the burden of morbidity and mortality from malaria within the Saria Health District through active detection of fever cases, testing and treatment of confirmed malaria cases. And then the specific objectives were we wanted to evaluate um, the effectiveness of this program um, and then to re also to reduce the morbidity and mortality and, and, and then reduce the prevalence as we had seen before. We wanted to see, is this feasible uh, on a larger scale and does it, does it work in the same way as what we saw? So how are we gonna measure this? Well, first of all, we wanted to look at just the numbers of cases that were detected. Um, was it the same, you know, in where we were able to continue to, to detect this many, this many cases? Um, you know, what we had seen um, in the first studies of the original pethidone program was that, you know, we were seeing out, outcomes of, in, of decreases in, in deaths, but really they weren't testing that many people. So how many people were they going to be testing in these active sweeps? But we were also really interested in looking at what were they doing the rest of the week? Because it wasn't just the active sweep. They still were doing their regular volunteer job where they had um, tests and treatment in their hut um, the rest of the week where people could still seek care. And what we were concerned about was kind of an unintended consequence of people waiting um, for the sweep in order to get tested. And so we really wanted to look at, okay, what's happening during the rest of the week? How many cases are they seeing through passive case detection? We wanted to look too at the number of severe cases that they were detecting and then estimating the malaria prevalence. Um, so which again was doing the, the whole sweep and then looking at the number of positive, or the proportion of positive RDTs out of the whole population. And then we wanted to compare this with other, um, other villages who had a community health worker who had the passive pachydome program. Um, and we also wanted to look and see at the number of, of cases that um, were showing up at the health facilities from both, both the passive and, and the active um, villages. So here's a map of where all the villages were, um, just, to, just to get a sense. So we had 15 villages um, in the intervention arm and then 15 in the, in the control arm. Um, and they were, it was done with a, a convenient sample um, because we wanted to be able to really monitor and um, the data quality that was coming out of the villages. Uh, essentially the, the red um, intervention villages is, is where Peace Corps volunteers could easily get um, regular access and, and, and monitor. Um, and whereas the, the blue villages, um, we just went out there every, um, three times at the beginning and the middle and the end in order to do the same, use the same sweep methodology in order to, to monitor how the prevalence um, was comparing in those villages. So this is a timeline. Um, we trained the community health workers um, or home care providers as we sometimes we had referred to them on the active sweep methodology in, in, in June. We just tagged this day on to a training that they had about integrated community case management. The whole idea was not to do anything vastly different from what was already happening in the health system, but really to just add on this extra little innovation. There was nothing, nothing revolutionary. It was just this small tweak that we really felt could make a big difference. Um, and then after that training, the, the sweeps started in July. And so there was 21 weeks of sweeps over the course of the rainy season. 
And then you see these bullets here at the bottom, there's the baseline, midline, and endline comparison studies where we went to the other 15 villages um, and did our RDTs on everyone that was symptomatic. Um, also, as in the original um, project, there was community women were trained. Um, they were trained on identifying the signs and symptoms of malaria and the importance of, of early care seeking. So here's just some photos. There's the training of the of the cohort of community health workers um, at, the, at the health center. We went over, you know, data collection was the main thing because everything else they already knew how to do. It was more that we just really needed them to um, be um, recording a lot of the data um, in a more systematic way than they maybe did sometimes. Um, the level of literacy is was variable. The Senegal does require that um, community health workers have literacy in some language, um, but that the level of literacy really varied. Um, so we spent a lot of time, like most of this, like looking at the data collection tools. And here is just the training of the Peace Corps volunteers that were involved. People were really excited to be involved in this, and they often. And so the first day, when everyone was, uh, when we were doing the baseline, um, everyone all the community health workers had a Peace Corps volunteer that was there with them to help answer any questions and just make sure that the data was being collected uh, accurately. And then as I mentioned, there was a training of, of women, um, one from each major family compound um, to be the kind of the person that was the point person when the community health worker would arrive. The community health workers were the ones that did um, the training um, and we were just there hanging out and observing and supporting. Um, and then this is the um, the first day of, of sweeps, um, where they, the beginning of 21 weeks of sweeps. Um, and this is a village that had really big family compounds, and they were doing a lot of a lot of tests. Um, so the results, and first, so the first thing was just, is this feasible? Is it is it possible to ask community health workers to to do this every week? Um, we did pay them a stipend, it was about $5 per sweep, um, which is about what they were making um, their volunteers in terms of um, just providing malaria care, but they would get paid to do something like a bed net distribution. Um, so we paid them the same amount that they would get paid um, for any other kind of malaria like active work that they were doing. And um, there's, you know, this big debate in the international community about whether you should pay community health workers. Um, and I come down firmly on the um, side of that. Yes, if they're, they're, if they're doing this work, you need, they're not out in their fields. Um, you need to be, you know, compensating them for this. Um, and they reacted obviously very positively to that. Um, and 89% of the possible sweeps um, were completed. Uh, and then eight of the 15 conducted every single one. And this is over a five month period. So the ones that weren't, um, completed. Um, the first, one of the first reasons was gold mining. This is something that we were really worried about because when you're a volunteer community health worker and all of a sudden there's a gold rush happening near you, what's your incentive to stay in your village when you could go and potentially make it, uh, you know, find, find gold. And so we were, we were worried about that because that was a huge threat to the health system just in general. I mean, it was a threat to everything. I, we did a, um, this, over spring break at the school on an unrelated project worked um, on trying to keep, keep, keep kids in school because kids were dropping out of school to go, go mine gold. And one of the things that we had organized was this career panel and the teacher that was supposed to speak on the career panel didn't come because he had left to go mine gold. So like, it was a big concern that we would have like that, that people, you know, wouldn't be in their villages to, to do the sweeps. And there were 10 sweeps out of 294 across the 15 villages in 21 weeks. There were 10 that were missed because the community health worker just couldn't get themselves back from, from the gold, mine, gold mines. Um, the, the other thing that's worth mentioning was stockouts. So as, as I mentioned the year before, the, the project could not continue in um, all of the villages where it had been designed to because of RDT stockouts. Um, but there was only actually one RDT stockout that was um, unable to be completed uh, one sweep that was unable to be completed because of RDT stockouts. And this was really encouraging. Um, and what we were really trying to show was that um, if 
with a proactive model of community case management, we could actually be more proactive about the supply chain. So if the, the community health worker knew that they were going to be going out on a Monday, um, on Saturday, they would like assess their stock and get in touch with the health post nurse and say that they needed, you know, they needed more where the, the system hadn't really been um, really pushing people to think ahead in terms of their, of, of their supplies in the, in the passive model of community case management. Um, so what, you know, what we found was that, yeah, it really was feasible. Um, so if you, this is over the 21 weeks is what we, what we saw. So the, the red line here is kind of a busy slide. I'll walk you through it. The red line here um, is the RDTs that were performed week by week across the villages. Um, and then the green is the positive RDT. So this, you know, the test positivity rate um, is, is pretty high. They were, you know, pretty good at identifying who they needed to be testing. Um, in the, and then this blue line is a, where there was a, a bed net distribution that happened right then. This happened in both the intervention and the comparison villages that had retained the passive model. And then um, seasonal malaria chemoprophylaxis, which is where what I, the intervention that I mentioned earlier, that's a new intervention of giving kids preventive doses once a month, um, for, started for the first time in Senegal um, in, in early November of that year. Um, and so that's what that orange line represents. So what you see is these lines that fall um, throughout the course of the rainy season. And what you see in the background is just the, the health facility incidents. So for the entire district, just it's a different scale, but just to show where the where the peaks are over the over the rainy season. And so um, we're in about you know late September, early October, things really start to stay down um, in the, our intervention villages. That's not what the, the trend doesn't do that across the district um, until you know December. Um, one so there was one village that I just wanted to highlight in that. This is one one of the intervention villages. Um, Elton. Sorry. Oh. Um, this village, um, Tabanding, where um, this is the the prevalence across um, across the village, and after September twenty third, they did not have a single positive case, um, which was just really really remarkable. And looking in the health post records, there was no positive cases that went to the health facility from that village either. So. Um, whereas in, in the, the, the rest of the district, you're seeing really malaria starting to peak around here in that specific village, there was no more malaria after that time. So then when you bring in these comparison villages, remember we did these, did these sweeps to get to be able to compare the prevalence at the baseline, midline, and midline in, in these other 15 villages. Um, and at the beginning um, of, of the project, the intervention villages have a prevalence of sy symptomatic malaria that's a little bit higher, but they're about the same. In the midline, in the midline it's, it's about two and a half times higher in mid-September, and then by the end of November, it was 16 times higher um, in, in the comparison villages than in, in our intervention villages. Um, and these, you know, again, these comparison villages had the, pe the, the Pecadome passive program. It, the only difference was, was the weekly sweeps. Um, so then looking again at, at treatment-seeking behavior, um, like I mentioned, we did, we looked at the, both, the, both the data from the active sweeps, but also the, the passive. Um, and we saw that um, our, in our intervention villages, the majority of, of tests that were performed and the cases that were detected were actually done during the rest of the week. So people were coming um, more than they had, more than they were being, than cases were being identified during the sweep, which was just one of the most encouraging findings that we could possibly have. And so, Really, um, what my take on was is that the sweeps really started a virtual cycle, a virtuous cycle where um, the community members could start to have trust in the community health worker, see that they knew what they were doing um, as a result of the sweep. They could see that these drugs were available and were effective and that they were free. So um, the conclusion of, of the study was that um, the elements of this um, that were, you know, a prolonged and community-based model of active case detection that just focused on the symptomatic cases was a cost-effective way of increasing appropriate case management. Um, so that was that was what we concluded. And then what came next, um, I then um, presented this data to the Sen Senegal's National Malaria C Control Program, which was just incredibly exciting as a, as a Peace Corps volunteer. 
Um, and they took the data and they decided that in 2014, they were going to scale it up to the entire region of Ketagu. So it went from 15 villages to 146. Um, and then the next year, they added an additional region and we were up to 246 villages. And then in 2016, they added two more um, and we're up to 708 villages. Um, it was a good timing in that um, over the weekend on uh, Saturday, which was World Malaria Day, um, we published a paper about this scale up. Um, and it was just really exciting because I think a lot of people see the, the result, these incredibly exciting results from the pilot study and they think, yeah, well, anything's possible in a pilot setting. But what they saw during the scale up was that really this continues to be feasible and it continues to be effective at scale. Um, the number of patients that were receiving um, an RDT from a community health worker increased by 307%. And the number of malaria cases detect, detected um, increased by 274%. And um, it also saw an increase of care, in care seeking throughout the week as well. 104% um, um, increase of RDTs and 77% increase in, in, in ACTs administered through passive case detection alone. Um, so then um, Peace Corps volunteers. Um, I would, there's a, a network called Stomping Out Malaria in Africa that um, brought Peace Corps volunteers together to share best practices and have a really intensive malaria boot camp training. Um, and so um, volunteers led pilots in several other, other countries in, in Togo and Benin, no, most notably. Um, and in Benin, especially, especially there's, um, it's being scaled with PMI support um, little by little. Um, and in Madagascar, also with the involvement of Peace Corps, they did a randomized control trial um, where they actually had a much bigger budget. And so um, rather than just estimating the prevalence, they, um, they did, you know, blood tests of everybody, regardless of um, whether, you know, they had symptoms of malaria. And they also tested for anemia and found that um, the weekly sweeps um, decreased the prevalence of anemia in women, which was another exciting thing that we hadn't been able to measure with the small budget of the Peace Corps-led study that we did in 2013. Um, as I mentioned, Senegal is relatively low burden of malaria compared to other places. Um, and so there's a Gates-funded study of the same approach as um, in Uganda in a, in a really high prevalence area where um, they're doing an insecticide res or indoor residual spraying of insecticide in houses, and which, that, which typically has the effect of knocking down the prevalence um, and the burden quite significantly, but then they're gonna start they're doing the sweeps as um, kind of a follow-on in order to maintain the gains that are done during spring. The spring is really an expensive intervention um, that hasn't been shown, shown to have as lasting of, as it, of an impact as we would like. So we're trying to bring in these, these weekly sweeps in this setting to, um, to see if we can keep the gains down. And modeling showed that it would be really effective, but I haven't actually seen the results yet. Um, the Gambia, which is inside Senegal, um, as Senegal was scaling it up, they just decided that they were going to implement it nationwide um, like a couple years ago and just went ahead and did that, which was really exciting to see. Um, and then there's an upcoming upcoming um, operational research study in, in Zambia that's going to, um, is, a, is a PMI funded um, study that unfortunately was supposed to start and had to get postponed by a year um, because of COVID-19. Um, so that's unfortunate, but um, it's exciting to see. It's pretty, it's pretty high profile, so it's exciting to see where that's going to go. Um, so that, that is um, what's happened since, since 2013 when I led the study. Um, and I'll just say thank you um, and take any questions. There's, I think, questions in the chat um, as well, um, or you can just um, unmute yourself and ask. So while we're waiting for questions, let me ask one. Um, you know, I thought the results that you presented were really impressive, Annie. And can you, you know, what do you think is the most important explanation for the fact that it was sustained like it was? I mean, I think the, the pilot project and while you were there, all of that, I could see that. But the sustainability aspect is particularly impressive. What, what do you think explains that? I mean, I think a big part of it is that all the pieces were already there. I mean, we, there was nothing really, you know, new that we were introducing. There was no, um, you know, fancy new technology to roll out and sustain. It was it was simply a tweak on the existing system that was already in place. 
Um, and um, I think that just you know the virtuous cycle that I that I talked about of the community recognizing the community health workers. I mean, they felt that too. And you know, the in the pilot, the, the folks that I was working with, they were so excited about it because they felt like people were really recognizing the, their value and what they brought to the com the community. Much in, in, they were, had much more visibility, and so they were excited about it and wanted to do it more. Um, so I mean, I think that those those pieces are. Um, a part, a big part of the puzzle. Uh, okay, Annie, there's a um, chat question. Do you want to open the chat and read it or should I read it out loud? Oh, um, how does the Gates Malaria Partnership fit into your current work? Um, so the Gates Foundation, they're actually, um, what they have done in, in the past is that they've um, focused on elimination countries. So the elimination eight, which is in mostly Southern Africa, um, they're rethinking, they've you know redone their entire malaria strategy recently. And so we're now focusing on more high burden country and countries. But what's following is they're currently um, rethinking their um, integrated um, community case management strategy. So um, in my current role, I'm, I'm you know talking with them about how their strategy can best um, align with what PMI is doing and not overlap and, and just really complement each other. Um, and as I mentioned, they are funding um, the Uganda study. Um, and I think there are some advocates for this approach within, within Gates as well. Um, then there's a question that came in. Um, how is the study funding allocated amongst the various parts of the study? So as I mentioned, there was a per diem paid to community health workers that um, was, was not part of what had the existing system. So um, part of it went to, went to community health workers, part of it went to um, the paying for, for the train, you know, the day of training. This was, and I'll say the, the budget for this study was $8,000. So it was, you know, pretty minimal. You had to make, make do with, um, you know, limited, which is, you know, it, it was a very limited amount of funding. Um, but it's more than what Peace Corps volunteers can usually do. And I was really fortunate um, to have an advocate, um, the, the PMI um, advisor from the CDC that was in Senegal at the time was a huge um, part of this and was a huge advocate. So it got us some extra funding. Um, so, and also just, you know, in terms of getting, you know, supervi supervisions for the, for the comparison sweeps and, you know, getting the Peace Corps volunteers out to these places, you know, paying for gas and for drivers, um, logistics, things like that. Um, and then there's another question. Um, did the community health worker recruitment pool change during um, the evolution of their role? Um, I think, so we, um, at least in the pilot, we only used villages that already had community health workers. It, was, it, it wasn't um, expanded. So because we really wanted to just build off of what was there. Um, and so I, I don't, not, not that I can comment on. I'm really Annie, interested. a couple of questions kind of following up from what Peter said. Um, and it relates to buy-in by the community. Um, one, there were no women community health workers. That might not be unusual in Senegal. Um, but did, did you, has during the scale up, has the pay or the training increased for the community health workers? And secondly, um, did the local government officials or the health department begin to do the administration or did it stay in the hands of Peace Corps volunteers with some oversight? Just talk a little bit about what happened during that expansion. Yeah, great questions. Um, so first of all, yeah, there within the villages that had been selected, there were um, no, no women, but there was a woman community health worker in one of the comparison villages, which I was always excited to go visit her. Um, and that is not unusual, unfortunately. Um, in, this, in this area, there's less women that are illiterate and that's since that's one of the um, criteria. And also it's, it's selected by the community and often they selected men. Um, there was a lot of, you know, we work with a lot of women at the health facility level at the health center where I worked uh, at the district. Um, there was a lot of um, women who had positions of, of authority. They all came from Dakar um, and were, you know, 
um, sent essentially um, by the government to the outer reaches of the country. Um, and yeah, so the from the beginning, um, I think, and this is you know, part of the philosophy of Peace Corps is that you're not going in and doing something for someone else, you're doing it alongside with the, the local health system. And I think that this is really why this worked is that everything was done in partnership with the local health system. So in the first pilot in one village, it was um, the health post nurse oversaw everything and that, you know, it was designed with a community health worker. And then when I was leading the study, I worked with the um, the chief medical officer of the district very, very closely and his, you know, his buy-in was what pushed everything forward. It wouldn't have happened without him. Everything was done. The supervision was done um, by nurses. Um, everything was, was done through the health system. Um, and that continued as, as it scaled up. And each year, Peace Corps kind of took a, took a seat, you know, further and further more removed from the leadership of the program. So I think in 2014, there was a grant that Peace Corps got, but it was mostly just like, um, you know, just periphery logistical support. Like they called community health workers to, to encourage them and, you know, helped with, um, helped out with the trainings. But at that, even in, in that first scale up to the region, um, it was entirely run by the health system. Yeah, Annie, I was going to ask you a question about community health workers. I think you touched on it a little bit in terms of the selection process. Um, you know, can you tell us a little bit more about how they were selected and what criteria were used and whether this was seen as a really good job to have in, in the village? Yeah, I mean, so it, it, and I think this this varies um, in every country, but um, in Senegal anyway, um, it was yeah someone you know from the village, um, someone, and they had to have um, literacy in either in French or in a local language. Um, it was almost always French. Um, most people had gone to some school, and so I spoke some French and had literacy um, in French. Um, and yeah, I think it was it was seen as as a, re a respected job it was often I think like someone related to the chief it seemed like um, and, and I was never involved because I, I worked in a in a town where the, the health center was I, I was never like involved with the, the selection process of a community health worker but if there was ever a new one that was trained there would be like a, a celebration and they would really try to elevate the position in the community and that was you know that was part of uh, the approach that was taken um, Okay, any, any final questions? It looks like there's some in the chat. Did I say that there's a paper published on the study and could I provide a title and link? Yeah, so I published a paper on the study that I led in, in 2015. Um, and then just this weekend, the scale up, had, there was a paper published. So I can, um, I can send, yeah. I think I actually have the, the one about the scale up pulled up here because it's so recent. Um, and I can get the other one in a second. Um, and then there's one more question. As you mentioned, the scales everything up and actually boosts the local economy. Yes, community health workers, but also trainers, drivers, and support staff. This broadens the case for support beyond healthcare. Um, and yes, agreed. <laughs> Annie, I want to thank you so much. Um, this has been a really informative talk. Uh, I'm really just so impressed by the work that you did when you were in the Peace Corps and, and mobilizing the Peace Corps to carry it on and uh, and then really continuing with this kind of uh, interest and uh, commitment uh, in your current career. So that's uh, that's all really comes together beautifully for you and, and uh, with some really impressive results, not just in Senegal, but more widely now as you as you moved on to other places to do this same kind of work. So uh, on behalf of all of us, I want to thank you and congratulate you on, on the amazing work that you've done. Thanks so much. And so I also forgot to mention at the beginning of the lecture that this lecture series of global one, public... One yeah, go ahead, Chris. Uh, one, one criticism. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Sierra Leone and you haven't gone there yet and I'm wondering when you're going to go there. <laughs> they have mosquitoes also. So, so PI actually expanded to um, Sierra Leone um, in 2017. Obama announced more funding for it in the State of the Union, and um, Congress responded, and we were able to expand to Sierra Leone. So it's one of the new countries. There you go. Chris is very happy now. So, 
Um, so anyway, I, I was going to say that uh, this lecture series is co-sponsored by the External Advisory Committee, and we happen to have uh, two, the two co-chairs of the External Advisory Committee for Global Public Health here tonight. Chris Sigler just asked that last question, and Brian Sippy, so thank you for coming. And also co-sponsored by the Institute for Health and Humanities. And we want to give a special uh, recognition to the Mon uh, to Montana Missoula Community Access TV for their work that they're doing to help provide uh, uh, a vehicle for people to see the lectures, even if they can't attend them in person. Uh, now, um, maybe um, uh, Kelly would like to say a little bit about next week's lecture. Yeah, hi everyone. We um, have added one more lecture onto the series this year. So there's a finals week lecture for those of you tied to the university. Um, and we have invited Dr. Josh Christensen, who is um, infectious disease doctor at Providence Health and Services at St. Patrick Hospital in Missoula. He's also the medical director of care and isolation unit at St. Pat's Hospital. And the title of his talk is COVID-19, Most Important Pandemic in a Century, a Clinician's View. So he obviously is talking about the current pandemic. And um, so that's kind of, it will be interesting to me to see a local connection to that. Okay, so I will see all of you here next week. And thank you again for coming tonight. Kelly, are you still there? I am. Um, can you make sure that that gets announced to uh, groups like the HEAT group, um, you know, with pu public health? They meet Friday at noon. Um, I guess. It, it, uh, yes, anything you want to um, pass on, you can email me or. I think that, it would be good. that would be a good way for the nursing homes in town and all the members of the heat group or the health, whatever, it's the public health, they're meeting every Friday and they've really brought in all the, um, the nursing homes are in, the folks who are working on COVID. It's like, it'd be a great way to get that out to people that that talk's going to be next Wednesday. Okay, I'll try and find that um, group and make sure they know. Okay, I'll try and find them before this Friday so they can announce it at their meeting. I'll send you the heat link after this. Great. Thank you. Thank you.